Chapter 11 starts the uh, discussion of the assembly in the Corinthian church. And one of the matters discussed in the first 16 verses was the matter of dress in the assembly. And the basic teaching there is that the women especially are to dress in such a way as to be modest and respect their head or their husband. And then starting in verse 17, he began, Excuse me, he began to talk about the Lord's Supper. And uh, I pointed out to you last time the recurrence of this word, come together, come together. You have it in verse 17, you have it in verse 18, where it says, when you come together in ecclesia, in the church, in the assembly. Uh, you have it again in verse 20, when therefore you come together. Uh, you have it in verse 33 and 34. Uh, so uh, it's, it's prominent. And then I pointed out that it continues in chapter 14. If you go over to 1423 again. 1423. If therefore the whole assembly comes together in one place. And then in verse 26, you have it again. What then, brothers, when you come together? So these are the chapters which deal with what happens when the church comes together. Now, in the Corinthian church, they were making the Lord's Supper into a display of division instead of a display of unity. And they were mm -hmm. also making it into like a common meal, which um, is not supposed to be the case. So in verse 23, Paul reverts to that which he received from Jesus to show them the important uh, facets of the Lord's Supper. So he says, I received from the Lord, meaning from the Lord Jesus, that which also I delivered unto you. By the way, you haven't had Galatians, Ephesians yet, <clears throat> but in, in Paul's writings, the word tradition, tradition means something which is passed down from one person to another. And there are um, human traditions which are passed down from one human to another human. And there are divine traditions which are passed down from God to man. There's a difference in divine traditions and human traditions. So, a word that goes along with this idea of tradition or that which is passed down is this word receive from. Uh, it's para lambano, P A R A, para, and then lambano, L A M B A N O, lambano. So, I received from the Lord that which I also passed on to you. See, that's the very def definition of a tradition, but it's a divine tradition, one that has been received from Jesus Christ. So this tradition is that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, the word for given thanks, give thanks, is eucharistia, eucharisteo. That's E-U-C-H-A-R-I-S-T-E-O, eucharisteo. And you're probably aware that many churches call the Lord's Supper the Eucharist. And the reason they call it that, excuse me, the reason they call it that is because, excuse me, uh, see if that's going to pass or not. The reason they call the Lord's Supper the Eucharist is because they are doing a lot of Eucharisteoing. They're giving thanks. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. This is um, the thing that Jesus told us to do in the Lord's Supper prayers, and we may have talked about this before. 
But too many of our Lord's Supper prayers are, help me, help me, help me. And the Lord's Supper prayer that Jesus told us to pray was, thank you, thank you, thank you. So if you want to get down to what the Lord's Supper prayers are really supposed to be about, it's not help me, help me, it's thank you, thank you, thank you. That's the essence of the Lord's Supper prayers. So it's a time of giving thanks for the wonderful grace of God, for the sacrifice of Jesus, for the wonderful love of God that he showed at the cross, for giving us the body of Christ, for cleansing us with his blood. It's thank you, thank you. Eucharistia. Thank you. So if you, if you pray a prayer and you'd say everything else in the world and help us to do this and help us to do that, but you don't get around to thank you, your prayer is lopsided, and it's not what Jesus said to do. Remember, Jesus said, do this. And part of what he said, a major part of what he said, was to thank you. So, um, he gave thanks. He broke it, and he said. Now, um, if you um, are reading the King James tradition here in verse 24... It will say, this is my body which is broken for you. <laughs> but if you have a textual variant there and you look at your textual apparatus, you will see that in the old manuscripts, the ones that go way back, the part about broken is not in there. It just says, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Uh, write down in your notes next to verse 24. John 19, verse 36. John 19, 36. Matthew, read me John 19, 33 through 36. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediate blood and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. For these things come to pass to fulfill the scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. All right, so... When we talk about the broken body of Christ, we're really not speaking in harmony with Scripture. <clears throat> okay? Now, why did Jesus break the bread? So he could pass it out. Um, that's the only reason. The breaking of the bread has nothing to do with uh, something significant for the supper. Illustration. Matthew chapter 14 Go to Matthew chapter 14. Go down to verse 19. This is the feeding of the 5,000. Matthew 14, 19. Let's see. Elijah, how about reading Matthew 14, 19 for us, please, sir? Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food. And breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. Uh, he blessed and broke and gave. Why did he break the five loaves? So he could pass them out. See? Uh, the word bless, when it's used in this sense, means to thank or praise God for something. The Jewish blessing over the bread went like this. Thanks be to you, or blessed be you, O Lord our God, who bringeth forth bread from the earth. Blessed be thou, O Lord our God, King of the earth, who bringeth forth bread from the earth. So you're not blessing the bread in, in the sense you're doing something to the bread. You're blessing or thanking or praising God for the bread. Okay? So the other versions in other passages say he thanked God for the bread. This says he blessed the bread. That means the same thing, exactly. To bless is to thank or praise God for something. So you're not putting a whammy on the bread. That's Catholic transubstantiationism. 
you're thanking God for the bre bread. Um, so it's sort of like Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Blessed be God means thanks be to God, praise be to God. So if you're going to bless the bread, here's what you do. You say, blessed be thou, O God. Praise be unto you, O God, for giving us this bread. If you're going to thank God, you say, thank you, O God, for giving us this bread. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. And yet half of you, or three quarters of you, are going to get up next Sunday morning and you're going to pray over the Lord's Supper and you're going to say, Lord, bless this bread. And he's not going to do it. You're barking up the wrong tree. He's not going to do anything to that bread. You're, you're blessing God for the bread. You're not doing anything to the bread. See, the Catholic priest goes, Hoc est corpus meum. And they think he's putting a whammy on the bread and changing it into the actual flesh of Christ. That's what they mean by blessing the bread. But when you say bless the bread, that is a carryover from Catholicism, which is unscriptural. You're thanking God for the bread. You're not doing anything to the bread, and God's not going to do anything to the bread. Now, go to Matthew 15. And verse 36, this is the feeding of the 4,000. Matthew 15, verse 36. How about Austin? Matthew 15, 36. And he took the seven loaves and the fish, and giving thanks, he broke them and started to give them to the disciples. Disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. Now, how come he busted those fish and how come he busted those loaves? Pass, pass them out. That's it. That's all. Okay. Now then, let's go over to Mark chapter 6. Excuse me. Let's don't go Mark. Let's go Matthew chapter 26. Compare this to the, re to the wording in the feeding of the 5,000. Matthew 26. Verse 26. Let's see, Jack. Jack the giant killer in the back row. <clears throat> While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples. Okay, then. After a blessing, in other words, he thanked God or praised God for it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples. Again, how come he broke it? Well, to represent his broken body. No. His body was not broken. He, he blessed it. He broke it in order to pass it out, just like they did in the feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000, etc. Now, look at Luke chapter 22. I want you to keep your hand in Matthew 26, verse 26. And I want you to look at Luke chapter 22. And I'm thinking about verse 19. Luke 22, 19. How about coal? Where's that coal? Right here, sir. Read, read for me, bruh. <laughs> <laughs> and when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now compare... Matthew 26, 26, where it says, in Matthew, Jesus took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it. Then Luke 22, 19, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it. Now, did he do two different things in those verses, or the same things described in different words? Oh, he did the same thing. He did the same thing because to bless means to give thanks. Everybody repeat. To bless means to give thanks. Bless means to give thanks. So do not, I know you're going to do it anyway, but do not go to the Lord's table next time and pray and say, Lord, bless this bread. Don't do that. Because God's not going to do anything to the bread. What you are supposed to do is give thanks to the Lord. 
like that song says, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for he is good. That's what you're doing. And that's why they called the Lord's Supper Eucharist, because it was the giving of thanks for the wonderful things God has done for us. Have you got it or not? Yes? No? Yes. yes. Yep, I, go I, ahead. I, I, Sir. Can you, can you explain more, Matthew, where he says, this is my body? So there's no connection until after with his sacrifice until after it's in their hands. Okay. Don't get to pass it out. Um, but can you explain more the saying, this is my body? Yes. If okay. you'll look at Deuteronomy 16 and verse 3. Deuteronomy 16, verse 3, Brother Jacob. And you can read that one out for us. All righty. This is about the Passover meal, which Jesus was eating when he answered the Lord's Supper. Okay. Uh, 16, 3. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread, the bread of affliction, for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that all the days of your life you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. All right, now, go back to the part in the verse where it says that you may eat unleavened bread, the bread of something, it says. Bread of affliction? Ah, underline that, the bread of affliction. See, in the Passover meal... When they ate the unleavened bread, they were think of the thinking of the suffering and affliction of the Jews in slavery in Egypt. They were thinking of their suffering, their, their uh, tribulation, their affliction in slavery. So Jesus is eating the bread of affliction. He takes the bread of affliction and he says, now this is my body which is given for you. So what he's saying is from now on, you're not going to be thinking of the suffering and affliction of Israel in Egypt. You're going to think about my suffering and affliction as I died for your sins. That's why I said, this is my body, my affliction, my suffering. Okay, that makes sense. And when those Catholics are saying, hoc est corpus meum, over the bread, all they're doing in Latin is saying, hoc, this, est, is, corpus, body, meum, my. So all they're doing is repeating the words, this is my body, hoc, est, corpus, meum. It just sounds cool when you say, hoc, est, corpus, me, you know. But all it means is, this is my body. That's where they got the word hocus pocus because they thought that meant to put a massive whammy on the bread and change it into the quivering flesh of Christ. That's why you just stick a tongue out like this and don't touch it and let them put on here. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But that's not biblical. None of that is biblical. All right? We good? We're good. So back to 1 Corinthians, see. We got into this because of the, the King James tradition that says broken for you, which is not in the original text. So this is my body, which is for you. Compare Luke and his version, which is very similar to Paul's. Do this in remembrance of me. So what we're doing in the Lord's Supper is we're not in a contest to see who has the most followers. We are not in a display of division. We are not in a common meal. We're doing this to remember the Lord Jesus and his death. Okay? So do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25. This is 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25. Likewise, also the cup. That means, if you look at the verse 24, that he, in the same way, gave thanks for the cup, see, after the supper. And he said, take this cup, or this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, 
in the Passover feast, you can write this down, everybody had to drink four cups of wine during the long evening of the Passover feast. This was four cups of wine that were mixed with water. And the cups of wine in the Passover feast were dividers of the service into sections. Each cup uh, marked the beginning of a section of the Passover service. You can find all this described in the Mishnah, M-I-S-H-N-A-H, Mishnah, in the section called Pesahim, P-E-S-A-H-I-M, I-M, Pesahim 10. It's about the Passover feast. Everybody had to have four cups of wine during the night, and each cup divided the service into a section. If you go to the Old Testament references about the Passover feast, whether in the book of Exodus or in the book of Deuteronomy, there is no mention whatsoever of a cup in the Old Testament or any significance of a cup in the Old Testament. So the cup of wine was a later thing that they had that they used as a divider for the service. So in the Passover feast, there was no significance religious-wise to the cup. None. So when Jesus takes the bread of affliction and he says, this is my body, which is for you, you know. Now he takes the cup, which in the Old Testament or in the intertestamental period was just a divider. And he says, now this cup is the new covenant in my blood, or this is my blood of the new covenant, as some versions say. Do this in remembrance of me. So it's going to bring to their remembrance the blood of Christ, which was shed for their sins. And it's remembering the redemptive death of Christ. So it's not about division. It's not about who follows who. It's not about a common meal. It's about focusing on the redemptive acts of Christ and the, and the good God who gave us his body for a sacrifice and his sinless blood to cover our sins, and thanking God for that, and remembering that. Now, it is remembering it thankfully. Write that down. We're to remember thankfully the sacrifice of Christ. It's not designed to make us remember guiltily. It's designed to make us remember thankfully. Many people see the Lord's Supper as a time to be overwhelmed with guilt. That's never what God intended by the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a time to say, Oh God, I could never even be your child without Jesus. I'm so thankful that you are loving and kind and you gave me your son and you, you sacrificed his own body for me. Amazing love, how could it be that you, my God, would die for me? What language can I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend, for this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end? You know, that's what the Lord's Supper is about. Thank you. And it's about celebrating the idea that God has done this for us and remembering how good God is to us. And all of that leading us to the point where we say, God, you are so good and so kind and so gracious and I owe you so much. I'm just, I just want you to know that I'm going to keep on serving you and I'm going to keep faithful to my covenant that I have with you. See, that's, that's the Lord's Supper. So then he says in verse 26 here, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, notice this bread and this cup is different than any common meal. Whenever you do this, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. In other words, we're saying to the world, we believe in the redemptive death of Christ. We believe in the grace of God that's given to us through the sacrifice of Christ. This is where our hope is. This is where our faith is. We're proclaiming that to the world. So see, in 1 Corinthians 11, the Lord's Supper is a remembrance or a memorial, and it's also a proclamation of our trust in the death of Christ. 
But if you go back to chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, there it says the Lord's Supper is a sharing or participation or a fellowship. Is somebody putting a hand up back there or no? No. Nope, just stretching? Yeah. Okay. So it's a fellowship or a sharing in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17. It's a representation of that which we share with each other and that which we share with God. So the Lord's Supper is not one-faceted. It's multifaceted. It's a sharing or fellowship. It's a, it's a, a remembrance. It is a proclamation. It is a time of thanksgiving. And we can think about and process all of those different things during the time of the Lord's Supper. There's, there's nothing in Scripture that says that you must keep a, a mental picture of the bleeding, dying Jesus the whole time you're taking the Lord's Supper, if you're going to do it right. Nothing in Scripture says that. There's lots of different things you can think about during the Lord's Supper relative to its purpose and its, its uh, uh, who, who we are and what God has done for us and what he continues to do for us. Okay, back there in the corner, was that a hand or was that just a stretch? Oh, no, it's, it's not a hand. I was... Uh, Y'all are faking me now. Sorry. You were faking me on that corner, now you're faking me on this side. <laughs> okay, so let's go down to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. So then, whoever should eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, anoxios is the word, anoxios, unworthily. Now, most of your translations have tried to avoid the misunderstanding by translating this in an unworthy manner. That's, that's good because that gives us the meaning of it. Uh, if you're reading King James, it translates the adverb exactly as it is, unworthily. Now, somebody tell me the difference between the adjective unworthy and the adverb unworthily. The adverb modifies how it's taken. The adjective modifies the manner in which it's taken. Uh, you're right in the first half, but not in the second half. An adjective modifies a noun or a person, see? The adverb, which we have in the text, explains the manner or the way we're going about taking it. So it's not about the worthiness or unworthiness of a person. It's about the way we're going about taking the Lord's Supper. And he's talking about how the Corinthians were going about it in the wrong way by making it a show of competition and division. Whereas he wants it to be a fellowship and a memorial and a proclamation and a show of unity in Christ, see? So if we're doing it like the Corinthians, we would be doing it in, in the wrong way, in an unworthy manner, or we would be doing it unworthily. None of us will ever be worthy in the sense that we're sinless or we're perfect. None of us will ever get there, see? So that's not the meaning of it at all. It's, it's the way or the manner in which we go about doing it. <clears throat> Are we taking it seriously? Are we thinking about what God has done for us? Are we trying to show our gratitude to God? Are we looking at our brothers and sisters and thinking how glad we are that Jesus' blood covers them just like it covers me? Are we doing it as the body of Christ or as factious, divided people? See, that's the idea. How are we going about it? So, verse 28 says, let a man examine himself, and so, the word so, the little word huto, so, means in this way, in this manner. 
let him eat of the bread or drink of the cup. Okay? So if we're examining ourselves in the context of 1 Corinthians 11, we're saying, am I thinking about Christ as my leader and the unity of the body of Christ and how all of my brothers and sisters are part of Jesus and the body of Christ is for all of us and the blood of Christ cleanses all of us and I'm one with my brothers and sisters? Or am I all hateful and resentful of my brothers and sisters and am I divided from all of them and is there faction and division? See, that's what he really means in context when he says, let a man examine himself and so... Let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh uh, without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment or condemnation unto himself. That little phrase, without discerning the body, if you're going to be faithful to the context of 1 Corinthians 11, that means the church Go back to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 17. This is where this comes from. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 17. He says, Because there is one loaf and one body, because there is one loaf, and we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. See, it's, it's about unity and fellowship in the body of Christ. So if we take the Lord's Supper all factioned and divided, we are not discerning the body. We're not doing this as the body of Christ united, see. Now, one of the things that I think deserves some thought and I'm not talking about trying to divide the church over this in any way, shape, or form. Because, number one, <clears throat> the, the idea of taking communion away to people that were not able to attend is very ancient. In fact, the oldest accounts after the time of the apostles show that people did this. Probably their idea was that since the whole body is included in the in the fellowship of the Lord's Supper. Brother so-and-so who's got a broken leg over in his house, he's part of our fellowship too. He shares in the blood of Christ. He shares in the body of Christ. So we reach out to him with the communion and we include him in the body of Christ. See, that's discerning the body. There's good thinking behind that. On the other hand, on the other hand, the, the biblical example we have is when therefore you do what? He repeats it several times. I had you underline the phrases every time it occurs. When therefore you come together. Come together. So the design of the Lord's Supper is to be done in ecclesia, in the gathering, in the assembly. I don't believe God expects us to take the Lord's Supper if we can't be in the assembly because it's supposed to be done corporately in the assembly when you come together. I do, however, think it is in the spirit of 1 Corinthians 11 when people try to include as opposed to exclude people who are part of the koinonia, part of the fellowship, who can't be in the assembly. Okay? Now let's, let's take it one step further. I'm just asking you to think about this. There's no, you're not going to solve it right now. Let's say that brother so-and-so works a job at the factory, and so he uh, can't get here on Sunday morning, <clears throat> and then we um, get to Sunday night church, and he shows up at Sunday night church, and so we make this announcement, did anybody here not get to take the Lord's Supper? And we do one of two things. We'll say, it'll be prepared for you over in the conference room or whatever that room is y'all have over there. What do you call that thing? Chapel. The chapel. The chapel. Or, see, we do ours in the conference room. But if... 
If not that, in some churches it will be, if you haven't had the Lord's Supper today, would you please stand? And then they'll, one or two or three people will stand and then they'll serve them and everybody else will just sit there. Uh, you go to 1 Corinthians eleven thirty three. So then, brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Uh, go back to verse 20. When therefore you come together, it's impossible to take the Lord's Supper because each of you takes before the other his own supper and one is hungry and another is drunken. Somehow I don't think, I could be wrong, but I don't think they would have done it that way in the first century. I think they would have all taken it together. Uh, if... Uh, because it is a together thing. Um, Brother John Panisi, who is a retired missionary here with us that was in Brazil for 30 years, when he was preaching in Brazil, he would, he would go to some village and preach in one Brazilian town in the morning, and he would sit down with them and have fellowship with them in communion. He would travel to another city, and he would meet and preach for another group Sunday night and they would have their Lord's Supper and he would eat the Lord's Supper with them demonstrating his fellowship with them Lord's Day, Lord's Supper but in all cases he would eat and share with them to demonstrate that we share together See, well that is certainly in the spirit of what you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 because if there's any theme in all of this it is the Lord's Supper is a unity thing. It is a together thing. It is not a division thing. So I know traditions take over in our churches. It's just that as we teach on this, I think we need to teach about the spirit of unity and showing our fellowship that is at the core of Paul's theology of the Lord's Supper. And that goes beyond just the idea that we're thinking about the, the death of Jesus. Say so It's more than that. We're, we're putting our spiritual arms around our brothers and sisters and saying we are the body of Christ together. We are united in the blood of Christ. We are united in the body of Christ. So that's a big part of the feeling and thinking of the Lord's Supper. Okay, anybody want to ask anything about that? Yes, sir. Is it Benjamin? Yes. Son so, of my right hand. <laughs> yes. So what are your thoughts on um, church members taking the Lord's Supper to elderly people that are shut in after morning services because they physically cannot come to the building to worship with everyone? Well, again, I, I, I really think they're, they're thinking... In, within the spirit of 1 Corinthians 11 because they're trying to include them. Now, what if it's not elderly people, but what if it's young people that are sick and they can't come? Could they do that too? They have to come Sunday night. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so you're trying to include them. However, if I did that, I would probably, this is just me, I would probably take the Lord's Supper with the person instead of just serving it to them. Why would I do that? It's simply because I want to demonstrate that we're together in this. Yes, Brother Travis. Um, so I've been at congregations before where they had a Sunday night assembly and they split up to the four winds, tried to do a small group sort of a thing. Yeah. And I really stood up for, I was kind of very upset that they were actually taking the Lord's Supper when we, they came apart, they didn't come together, they came apart for it. Uh, so eventually they didn't take the Lord's Supper when they were apart. Um, but wouldn't that also sort of be in the spirit, but not in the letter of when we come apart together? Well, together well first question I would have to ask is, did they have a common assembly when they did take the Lord's Supper together? As the church, no, but as small little groups. Okay, so they weren't doing what 1 Corinthians 11, 
and verse, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians uh, 14, verse 23, when the whole church comes together in one place. They weren't doing that. No. So they were not a church. The way they were doing it, they were not a church. They were several small churches. See, the very definition of ecclesia is a gathering, a group. And a group of elders is over an ecclesia. That means one group that gathers together on a regular basis. Now, please don't misunderstand. I don't have a problem at all with small groups. As long as sometime on Sunday there is a general gathering of the entire church. And in that general gathering of the church, they take the Lord's Supper together. Small groups are fine, but the church needs to come together on the first day of the week sometime and take the Lord's Supper and do like it says in 1 Corinthians. Okay? Jack, are you are you raising or no? Oh no, it's not Jack, it's Sarah, isn't it? That's Russell. Is it Russell? Oh, oh, Russell. We get them Russell, you're hiding in front of Jack. I can't see you. Jack's bulk is taking you away. So go ahead. Jack's bulk. That's awesome. Now, that's not as bad as Carl. Look, when Carl's back there, it's impossible. Okay, go ahead, Russell. All right. So in verse 27 yep. of chapter 11, yep. uh, should, shall be guilty of the body. Could you explain again? which body that is referring to and why? <clears throat> well, I think, this is my thought, and it may be wrong, I think if they're doing this in a way to show division, then they're guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord in the sense that Christ gave his body and his blood to purchase the church. And he gave that body and that blood to foster the unity of the spirit not to create division and so they're guilty of showing disrespect to the body and blood of the Lord body and blood there certainly means um, the sacrifice of his body and the giving of his blood okay thank you yep all right so um, yep I have a question. I've yes, sir. Some congregations, um, like Sunday morning, they would take the supper together, and then suppose a couple of members weren't able to make it to the morning assembly, so they come to the evening assembly, and the um, if those if those two men raise their hand up to say they didn't get to take it, the entire congregation takes it together again. Is that? Better than just having those two men being served it? I, I think that's great if they do it that way. That's the way I would prefer to do it. Because, hmm. I don't know, it's, it's never felt right to me if uh, those two men are the only one taking it that evening. Because it just, it doesn't feel like we're necessarily united because everyone else is just watching them take it. Yeah, and then, then some people say, well, but you're doing it twice. Well, you're singing twice. You're praying at least twice, you know. You're probably giving twice. Well, it says give on the first day of the week, yes, but it doesn't say whether you can do it Sunday morning or Sunday night or both. So, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I just say I don't know how we solve all of this. All I'm saying is I think many people in their study of the Lord's Supper, since they only read on Sunday morning, they only read verses 23 through 26, they miss the context of this, that Paul's whole point is that while the Corinthians were doing this as a manifestation of strife and division, it's supposed to be done when you come together as a demonstration of fellowship and unity. That's the core idea in this entire passage. So somehow that needs to come out in the way that we do this. One of the ways I do that in my own experience of taking the Lord's Supper is as I take the Lord's Supper, I actually look around the room some at my brothers and sisters in Christ 
and I say to God, you know, thank you for these, my sisters, my brothers over here, and these over here, and these over here, that they share with me, koinonia, in the blood of Christ, and they share with me in the body of Christ. See, and I'm thinking about what we share. That's a totally different spirit than 1 Corinthians 11, see, where they were all divided and factioned from each other. Some, some people have tried to capture this spirit by everybody takes a piece of bread and they all hold it and then they all take it together, you know. And we don't have to do that. But whatever we do, we at least need to be conscious of the body of Christ as a unified whole coming together as the body of Christ. Okay. So then we have a little bit of a strange passage here at verse 30 and following. He says, for this reason, and I take that to mean because they were divided and factious and they were not discerning the body of Christ. For this reason, many among you are weak and sickly and some have fallen asleep. I think that means some have died. Uh, judge for yourselves. So, or, Let's see here. If we do not if we do not discern ourselves we shall not be discerned if we do not judge ourselves if we judge ourselves we shall not be judged how do you have it translated But if we judged ourselves rightly we would not be judged All right now let me ask you this in the end of verse 29 do you have judge or discern the body discern judge you have judge? Judge the body rightly. Interesting. Interesting. Because the word is diacrino, the same word in all three uh, places. I think what he means is if, if we don't properly discern each other and the unity of the body then we ourselves are going to be judged by God, see? Um, read me verse 32 there, Matt, in yours. What does it say? But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. All right, so was there some kind of an actual punishment that God was levying against the Corinthian church that was making some of them sick and caused some of them to die because they were, they were making a mockery out of the Lord's Supper? It almost sounds like that if you read verses 30 through 32. Uh, then verse 33, he says, So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. Why does he say this in conclusion? So then, you know, that's almost like in, in conclusion. When you come together to eat, wait for each other. Notice how different that is from backing up to verse 20 and 21 where he says, when you come together, uh, it is impossible to eat the Lord's Supper because each one of you takes before the other his own supper. Notice how different that is from verse 33. So then, brothers, when you come together, wait for each other. In other words, include everybody together in the process. If anyone's hungry, see, if this is about just eating food, let him eat at home. So that you might not come together unto judgment. See? And the rest I will command you when I come. So it's a together thing. If I, if I had to summarize the main point, the main idea in this passage, it is the Lord's Supper is supposed to be a unity and fellowship meal, not a display of division. Russell, I see you back there, bro. <laughs> Can you uh, explain a little bit more the 
the reason why verse 29, um, that body is referring to the, the fellowship idea. Well, again, that's my opinion based on the context. Uh, see, if you go all the way back to verse 17, when he says your coming together is not for the better but for the worse... Verse 18, for first of all, when you come together in the assembly, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Then when you come down to verse 20, when therefore you come together, it is not possible to take the Lord's Supper because each of you takes before the other his own supper. Say they weren't waiting for each other. They weren't including one another. Uh, that's a big part of it. The other part, if you go back to chapter 10... Read me, let's look at the last part of chapter 10, verse 16, where it says, the bread which we break. See that part, Brother Russell? The bread which we break. Chapter 10, verse 16. Yes. The bread which we break, is it not a fellowship of the body of Christ? For we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. We, we Christians who are many, are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. But that's not the way the Corinthians were doing it. See? Okay. Why so would it's, you not... Go ahead. Um, why would you not refer to the more immediate uh, context when they say you are guilty of the body in verse 27, why would you not make it uh, the body of Christ? So how would you, you would interpret this, uh, whoever eats and drinks not discerning the body, in other words, if you're not thinking about the dying body of Christ, you eat and drink judgment to yourself. But then you ask, now where has he said anything about that before? And the answer is nowhere. But he has said a lot in the two chapters here about being unified. And he says we Christians are one body because we all partake of the one loaf. Is that about the Lord's Supper or not? Yes, the partaking of the one loaf is about the Lord's Supper. I was... We, yeah. I was thinking that if it... If 29 was referring to the body of Christ and... Um, Which body were, of Christ? You mean the literal body of Christ? Yes, like in verse 27. Mm -hmm. Because you shall be guilty of the body in that um, you are not aware of it. You're, you don't know that it is the body of Christ that died and was resurrected. Uh, okay, but then what would the unworthy manner be in verse 27 in what way were they taking it in an unworthy manner if you look at the context before I took it to mean that the unworthy manner was still referring to um, lacking it being a proclamation and you're you know knowing that it's a proclamation of his death until he comes and lacking uh the idea of it being a communion and then being guilty of that because they don't know that jesus christ died and was resurrected mm, i think they know that jesus christ died and was resurrected that was part of the gospel that that was preached to them and that they received in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. It's just that they were not using the Lord's Supper as a holy supper to show their fellowship and to um, proclaim the Lord's death and to remember what he had done for them. They were using it as a divisive common meal. So yeah, I see where you're coming from. And I think one of the things that... that you and I look at things a little bit differently is to me, in my experience, context 
is everything that came before and everything that comes after. Context is not the verse that came before, just the verse that came before. It's everything that came before. And how does this section here fit into everything that came before and what comes immediately after? Okay. So, um, for example, if you keep going into chapter 12, look at verse 12 of chapter 12. For just as there is one body, and that one body has many members, and all the members being one are one body. Now, what are we talking about here? The body that is the church. Yeah, and if you back up to chapter 10, and you go to verses 16 and 17, the bread which we break, is it not a sharing of the body of Christ? Because... We, who are many, are one body, and we all partake of the one loaf. See? So both before it and after it, he talks about the fact that we're one body in Christ. But you people are doing the Lord's Supper as a division, and you're acting like we're not one body in Christ. So by doing that, you're doing it in an unworthy manner. See? So... That's how come I think what I think, but I understand what you're saying because there's a whole lot of people that think what you think as well. So we're cool. I'm just get, explaining why I think what I think. Thank okay? You. Yes, sir. All right, so. Dan? Yes? You mentioned verse 30 that you thought uh -huh. that perhaps that referred to the weak, the sickly, the few that were asleep, or the many that were asleep. Yep. Um, that that was some physical judgment that had been carried out against the uh, the Corinthians, but doesn't he tell them in First Corinthians fifteen twenty four to awake, to wake up? Would this potentially be a spiritual thing, or is awake thou sleeper and rise from the dead? Now some people think that this is talking about spiritual sickness, and it may be. Read read several different commentaries. There's, I don't know that there's any way we can solve it from the context, but that's the two views. Some people think that this is a spiritual sickness, a spiritual death that results from this kind of thing. Some people think he's talking about um, an actual judgment of God that was being leveled on these people. I don't know how you would, you know, end the discussion one way or another. Okay. All right. So. Oh boy, we're about to get into it. I see where we're about to get into. So we're going to need to at least take a breather before we get into this part in, in chapter 12 about spiritual gifts. Oh yeah. Okay. Looking forward to that. The demons. Then you'll all go be telling Denny on me. The demons. That one, that one too has been running through my mind. <laughs> I should ask him if they, since they named the Dodge Challenger the Demon I'm excited to this. Is. Probably is. <laughs> <laughs> since it's in, in chapter 12, we have this phrase, now concerning again, which uh, came up at chapter 7, verse 1, and in chapter 7, verse 25, and in chapter 8, Verse 1, now concerning food offered to idols. Now we've got now concerning spiritual gifts. Um, the spiritual gifts are discussed throughout chapters 12, 13, and 14 as part of the discussion of the assembly and uh, the, the coming together and what happens when we come together. And that all, not all of the spiritual gifts have direct connection to what goes on in the assembly, but the use of spiritual gifts was one of the things causing division among the Corinthians, and uh, so that kind of gives us a, a major context here. Think about this, that the idea that there be no division, um, 
the book of Corinthians gives us several different things over which the Corinthians were divided. Um, how do we treat the guy that's living with his father's wife? Uh, what about eating food sacrificed to idols? They were divided over how to deal with that. What about the Lord's Supper? They were divided in the Lord's Supper. See, now we have uh, spiritual gifts. So he says, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. Uh, for you know that um, uh, when you were Gentiles, um, you were led by dumb idols, something like that. Wherefore, I declare to you that no one who speaks by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can, can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, a little bit difficult to, uh, to get into what exactly he's saying here, except for in the Greek culture and in near Corinth and maybe even around Corinth, there were pagan oracles, pagan priests and priestesses that spoke in tongues like modern tongue speakers speak in tongues, kind of jibber-jabber type stuff. And some of them were anti-Christian in their messages, see? But the real speaking in tongues, which was the speaking in languages, like Russian or German or French or Spanish, but ancient languages, uh, that, was, that was different than pagan tongue speaking. But... Uh, he's going to go into kind of a theology of spiritual gifts here. Now, verse 4, 5, and 6 are really interesting. 4, 5, 6, and 7. And I'm going to go to the other camera here, get my content up on the screen, and see if I can show you a couple things here. Now, where is that thing? There it is. Okay, so we'll do this. And then we'll turn this light on and go like that. Now, I don't know if you can uh, if you could see this the way it is, that'd be great. If you can't, I'll get it bigger. But if you look at the beginning here of verse 4, 5, and 6, you've got this same word that begins verse 4, verse 5, and 6, and that word is the word differences or diversities. See that where my fat finger is going up and down? Diiresis. That's the word. It means differences. Okay? But on the other end of the verse, on the other end of verse 4, 5, and 6, and we'll zero in so we can see it, each verse begins with there are differences, but this says, um, but the same, the same, the same. So there are differences, but in each case, there's the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God. So the Corinthians were emphasizing this end of it. They were emphasizing the differences between people that had the different gifts. What does that lead to? Division. Division. But Paul was enter emphasizing the same Spirit, the same Lord, and the same God that was working through all of them. And what does this lead to over here? Unity. Now, wait a minute. Were we talking about division and unity at all in the previous chapter? Yes. Yes. <laughs> this is part of what Dan calls the context okay so notice there are four things here 
that spiritual gifts are called. There are differences of gifts. The word gifts is charismaton, charismata. Uh, you know, we, we use the word charismatic, charisma, gifts. There are different gifts. That's true. But it's the same spirit that is giving each one of those people their different gifts. So we all have the same spirit. We just have different gifts. All right. Now then, instead of calling them gifts in verse 5, he says, Is that Carl? It is. Yeah. I apologize. It's what, what are, what are you doing in here, Carl? I thought I got rid of you. <laughs> yeah, I'm the Bible geography. It's going to, to be from, huge. Uh, it's going to be huge. I'm sorry, Brother Owens. I took my whiteboard. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Now what's happening? Wait a minute now. Look. There's a big problem going on here. Well, there goes a big problem right there. Wow. Well, we're good. <laughs> Main part of this lesson. Well, All right. Now... We're back to our text here. There are diversities of gifts in verse 4. Verse 5 puts it in a different way. There are diversities of ministries. See, diaconia, diaconion, ministries, areas of service or work. So one of the things this teaches us is that a gift is something that is to be used in carrying out some kind of ministry. See? Gifts, ministries. The gifts are not different than ministries. They're talking about the carrying out of ministries is the employing of gifts, but different ministries take different gifts, see? So there are divis diversities of gifts, same spirit, diversities of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of workings. Now let's look at this word. Some of you have it translated different ways here. Let's see if we can pronounce this word. Energematone. Look at this first part. Energe. Energe. What word do we get from that? Energy. Energy. Energematone means there are different ways that God is working through each person. So he's not working through each of us in the same way. He's working through each of us in different ways, but it's the same God working in us. So what do we mean by a spiritual gift? Well, it's a gift because it comes from outside of us. It is a ministry because we use that gift in serving God in some area. And it is a working because it is God working through us in some unique way. Okay? So you could call them gifts. You could call them ministries. You could call them workings. And he says there are diversities of working, but the same God who works. See, God is working in Ergon. He's working all things in every person. So... You know, God may be working through one person to minister to the sick, and God may be working through another person to be an evangelist, and God may be working through another person to be a manager, and God may be working through another person in some other way. Okay? But then he says, but to each one, see, this is talking about the individuals, to each one is the manifestation of the Spirit given for the common good. Now, I want you to underline in these three verse or these four verses, gifts in verse 4, ministries in verse 5, workings in verse 6, and manifestation of the spirit in verse 7. And according to Dan, those four things all are talking about the same thing. A gift is a ministry, is a working of God, is a manifestation of the Spirit. But the Spirit manifests Himself 
in different ways in different people. Not the same way in all people. Now this is one area of theology where we really got a work to do in the church of Christ. Because I've heard all kinds of sermons that suggest that all of us are supposed to be doing all of the same stuff. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that we have differences of gifts and ministries and we're not supposed to all be doing all the same things. We're supposed to do different things to all work together to accomplish one purpose. But you may be one that shows mercy and I may be one that gives and another person may be one that organizes and manages and another person may be an evangelist and another person may have the gift of being a pastor or teacher and we have different gifts. But it's the same God that works in us. Russell, you're talking to me. Hey, sir, I can see, looks like you're in a classroom with a whole bunch of desks. Well, I am. Is the camera not focused on me or something? Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Okay. And you are correct. I am in a classroom with a whole bunch of desks. <laughs> that is weird. Why is that weird? It's you're obvious. in a classroom. I thought you your office the whole time. Just kind of tripped me out. Yeah. It reminds me of like some. Well, I'm going to demon position. How do you even see the people here from that link? How do you. What? I, don't know if I guess his is like ours, you know, just far away at a wall. Huh. That's well, you are funny for many reasons, but um, here's the thing, Russell. Uh, many years ago, a man that lives here who, who is a CEO of, of a humongous computer processing company, he um, was using this technology to communicate with his um, people in, in Denver and in other places. And I said, you know, we could use that technology to teach students. So the Broadway church here bought all of that equipment that you're using and all of that equipment in the other room in there and all of this equipment that I'm using and using the technology of this guy we made this room into a video conferencing room and that room into a video conferencing room and that other room in the video conferencing room. And then we put a system in Guatemala and we put a system in the Ukraine and then we put a system in um, uh, uh, Haiti and we put one in Sorocaba, Brazil and other places. And your video conferencing system here is part of our global video conferencing system. So Broadway's global preacher training and Bear Valley Bible Institute are mashed up together training preachers. And that's why I'm in a classroom and you're in a classroom and sometimes we have students in this classroom that are in these classes and sometimes not. But that was a small parenthesis. So now we're going back to the idea of the spiritual gifts. Their, their <laughs> gifts, their ministries, their workings, they are manifestations of the Spirit. So, in what way does the Holy Spirit that dwells in all of us manifest Himself in different ways in different people? See, now we're talking about spiritual gifts. Who's that back there that's got a hand raised up now? Are you just stretching? No, it's cold. Hey, Cole. Hi, Cole. Hi, hi Mr. Owens. Um, I have a question about um, kind of the evangelism and merciful. I know that not everybody's supposed to be a teacher and not all that stuff, but um, as far as being merciful and um, trying to win souls over, wouldn't that be the job of every Christian? See, that's interesting. It might be in some small degree, but uh, there are three passages. Write this down, and this will help answer your question. There are three passages in Paul that are all about spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. That's one passage. Romans 12 
and Ephesians 4. Okay? Now, I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 12, 7. And I want you to flip over to Ephesians 4, 7. And look at both of these passages at the same time. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 7. And Ephesians 4, verse 7. All right, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Ephesians 4, 7, to each one is this grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he, that is Christ, gave gifts to men. And if you drop down to verse 11, it tells you what gifts he gave. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So this passage is about spiritual gifts, and 1 Corinthians is about spiritual gifts. They mention some of the same spiritual gifts and some different spiritual gifts in the different passages. But now, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 8, he lists off nine of the spiritual gifts, in verses 8 through 10. And then at the end of the chapter, at verse 28 and following, he lists some more of the spiritual gifts. Verse 28, God placed in the church, first of all, apostles, secondly, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, then helps, then governments, then different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? What's the answer to that? No. Are all prophets? Eh -eh. Are all teachers? Eh -eh. Are all um, workers of miracles? Nope. Are, do all have uh, gifts of healing? Eh -eh. Do all speak with tongues? Yet. They do not. Okay. Do all translate? No. So his point here is that people don't all have the same spiritual gifts. Now, before we go any further with questions and we're getting way ahead of ourselves, look at Romans 12. Or as Denny Petrillo used to say when he was little with me, he used to say, Womans 12. <laughs> now, he has corrected that in, in the time that's passed. But Romans 12, and if you'll go to verse... Um, three, he says, for I say through the grace that was given to me. Have I ever talked to you about that phrase before? Yes. What does that phrase mean? Spiritual gift of apostleship. Yes. I say through the grace that was given to me to everyone who is among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think but to think soberly as God has measured out to each one of us a proportion of faith. He's talking about according to the spiritual gift that God has given each one. Verse 4, For just as we have one body and many members, and not all the members have the same function, so also we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of it, having gifts differing according to the grace which was given to us. If it's prophecy, then let him prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. If it's ministry, then let him give himself to his ministry. He that teaches to his teaching. He that encourages, oh, I didn't know that was a spiritual gift, to his encouragement. He that gives, let him do it with generosity. He that manages, 
let him do it with diligence. He who shows mercy, Brother Cole, let him do it with sincerity. See? So there are different spiritual gifts. Now here's what I want you to do before you jump to conclusions. Listen to me. Escúchame cuidadamente un momento, por favor. What I want you to do is, I want you to start a list of spiritual gifts. I want you to, I want you to make a paper that has three columns. One is 1 Corinthians 12, one is Ephesians 4, and one is Romans 12. And we're going to take each one of those passages and we're going to list the spiritual gifts that we read about in each one of those passages. And when you've listed them all from each of those passages, then you'll begin to grasp some of the breadth and different qualities and so forth of different spiritual gifts. Okay? Now, the way Paul does this in the different passages, and we're going to get to this in 1 Corinthians 12, Cole, does everybody in your body have to be a thumb? No, sir. No. Does every single member of your body have to be an eyeball? No, sir. Does everyone in your body have to be a colon? <laughs> I would certainly hope not. No, I hope not, too. <laughs> and so Paul, in his passages, it's very interesting because in 1 Corinthians 12, he uses the body image, Russell. And in Ephesians 4, he uses the body image. And in Romans 12, he uses the body image to explain spiritual gifts. So we have many members in the body, Romans 12, 4, and not all the members have the same function, Brother Cole. So God expects different members of the body to function in different ways, all of them supporting the ultimate goals of the body, but their functions are not all the same. So does everybody have to be a teacher, an evangelist, a soul winner? I don't think so. But everybody needs to, in some way, con contribute to the, the goal of the Great Commission in some way. Maybe they invite visitors. Maybe they provide food for an event where they invite... I don't know. Go ahead, Cole. You still got a question. Well, I just... What I'm trying to understand is just because, like, say you have one spiritual gift, um, like Paul, he's an apostle. Yep. And he's also an evangelist and a teacher and a pastor. You know what I mean? All those other things. Yeah. So it's hard to understand, like... I don't understand if we're saying that... Because you're a teacher, being merciful is not your spiritual gift, so you don't have to worry about being merciful and encouraging Well, it's not that you don't ever have to worry about being merciful if you have the opportunity. It's just that that's not your main thing. Now, let me give you a good example of this that will illustrate it. Go to Acts chapter 6. You see, I, I sweep floors and I clean toilets sometimes. But I would not be being responsible with the gifts that God has given me if I spent all of my time sweeping floors and cleaning toilets. Go to chapter 6 of Acts and verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was multiplying, uh, the uh, Grecians, the Greek speakers, were grumbling against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily ministration of food. And so the twelve called together the multitude of disciples and said, now look at what they said there, verse 2, Cole. It is not fitting that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now that doesn't mean that the apostles thought they were too good to wait on tables. But what it did mean is the gifts that God had given them were vital to the teaching and preaching of the gospel and they needed people with gifts of mercy and other gifts 
to do the waiting on tables so that they could use the gifts that God gave them to most effect and preach and teach the word of God. It's not like if the apostle passed somebody in the ditch that he wouldn't try to give them some food, but the apostle was not going to spend all of his time going looking for people that needed food in the ditch. Are you with me, Brother Cole? Yes, sir. All right, so that's the idea here. So there are different things that need to be done which require different gifts. And one of the gifts that he lists in Romans is the gift of management. I do not have that gift. I am about as disorganized as anybody could be. But I do have some other gifts. So what should I do? Should I worry about being a better and better manager and just give all my time to being a better manager? No. I'm not going to be that good of a manager, even if I work hard at it. I should do what I do and let other people take care of the management. And that way, God's church will go ahead and move forward like it needs to. See, so uh, that's the basic purpose of the theology of spiritual gifts in Paul. And that is that the body of Christ has many different functions to carry out. And all of those functions are served by different spiritual gifts that have been given to members of the body. Does that make sense? Yeah. Then the only, I think, I don't know if my question was necessary, but I didn't, I didn't mean to say that people didn't have different um, responsibilities and different types of things that they're better at and different things like that. It's just the, we can, no matter, I, I feel like if whatever I'm doing, I can still be an evangelist. I can still try to be a soul winner no matter what area of the church I work in. And I can still be a merciful person and try to strive for that. And I can still try to be an encouraging person, even if that's not my main. Sure. And you plan to probably be a preacher or teacher of the gospel, don't you? Yes, sir. That's what I thought. That's what you're doing here. But there are other people that that idea just scares them to death. And they're saying, I could never do that. And you're saying, well, you could. But but as a preacher, instead of trying to fit that square peg into a round hole, what you should do is encourage that person that you may not be able right now to teach somebody, but I'll bet you you could invite one of your friends to come to class. Mm-hmm. And I'll teach them. See, now that's thumbs working with pinkies and everybody doing their job. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, is anybody else waving at me that I can't see real quick? Okay. Now, back to um, 1 Corinthians number 12. (laughs) All right. We're going to stick in Corinthians here, and then we're going to go into the um, other passages here in a minute a little bit. So we've got gifts, ministries, workings, manifestations of the Spirit. But notice verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 12. To each one, that's each individual, the manifestation is given for the common good. So God gives you the gifts he's given you for the good of the whole body. Not just for you, but for the good of the entire body. Because the body needs an eyeball. See? So if he chose you to be an eyeball, then you're there for the good of the body. Verse 8, he begins to illustrate differences of these gifts, ministries, workings. For to one is given through the Spirit the word of wisdom. See, that must be some kind of, uh, well, I don't know, I'm assuming, maybe I'm assuming wrong, some kind of extraordinary wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge. What the difference is in those, I couldn't tell you. According to the same spirit. To another, faith. According to the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing. According to the same spirit. To another, the working of mighty deeds. Uh, Some translate it miracles. The word is dunameon. Powerful deeds, mighty deeds. Um, To another, propheteia, prophecy. That means speaking by direct inspiration of God. Uh, To another, the discerning of spirits. 
uh, on discerning of spirits, uh, write down 1 John 4, verse 1. <clears throat> Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many <clears throat> false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John 4, 1. All right. So to another is given the discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of languages. And to another, the translation of those languages. Uh, all these things works one and the same spirit, giving to each one as he wills. So this says that the Holy Spirit or God determines which gifts will be given to which person. Now, I want you to I want to show you three passages that say this same thing. Verse 11 says it. Verse 18 says it in a different way. Drop down to verse 18. But now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body just as he wills. See so compare that to verse 11. The same spirit works in each one and gives to each one as he wills. So God decides if you get this gift or that gift and another person gets whatever gifts they get. This is a decision made by God. Look at verse 28 that says the same thing in a different way. God has placed in the church first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, etc., 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 who placed these gifts in the different members of the church? God did. The Holy Spirit did. People didn't choose these things. God chose these things. That's why they're called gifts. That's called their, why they're called workings or manifestations of the Spirit because God picks people to have these different gifts. All right, so different functions... See, you got to you got to admit that not all the members of the body have the same function, right? What is an eyeball supposed to do? See. See. But doesn't that mean he's supposed to do everything that thumbs and stomachs do as well? No. 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 See, y'all have learned two Spanish words: see and no. We we're not supposed to do the same things. We're supposed to be members of a body that all help each other toward a common goal by doing our part. So, um, now in verse 12, after he lists the first nine of these spiritual gifts, by the way, I was taught when I was growing up, there are nine spiritual gifts. Oh, really? You can read about them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10. So I took that to be the truth. But then I actually read my Bible. And, and I found out that if you keep reading the rest of 1 Corinthians 12, there's several others there. And there's several more in Romans 12. And there's several more over in um, Ephesians 4. And that there were a whole lot more than nine. Go ahead, Cole. Um, I just had a question about verse 9. Verse um, 9. To, uh, yeah, to another faith by the same Spirit, what would the spiritual gift of faith be? I don't know. Um, the best I can do for you in a commentary way is if you go over to 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 2. Read me, read me 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2, Brother Cole. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not love, I am nothing. So that prophecy and knowledge are some of the gifts that were mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, and so is faith. So this faith that can move mountains, this extraordinary measure of faith, I guess, is what he's talking about. I can't really say any more than that. Yes, sir. Wasn't that, I mean, I don't know where it was that in the gospel when Jesus says, so as we move mountains, wasn't that more of a figurative, just symbolic, not really literally saying move mountains? 
Well, he was saying that if you trust God enough, God can and will do almost anything. That sometimes it's us and our lack of trust and not the lack of the power of God. Um, Nothing's impossible with God, said the angel to Mary. Um, How shall this be, seeing I've never known a man? With God, all things are possible. So uh, some people are willing to go further in trusting that than others, and maybe that's a spiritual gift. Okay, so I want you to get the basic principles and not to get lost in the minutia. Uh, What I want you to get is the flow of the glue that holds this whole chapter together, not just what's this one and what's that one. Sometimes we don't know. Uh, Look at verse 12. For just as the body is one and it has many members... And all the members, being many, are still one body, so also is Christ. Do you think the Corinthians had a hard time grasping that concept that we're all unified in the body of Christ? Yeah, because they were divided, see? And he says, verse 13, now this is where our theology gets a little bit difficult because... See, most of us were, were taught growing up that the only way you get spiritual gifts is what? Laying on the apostles' hands. Yeah, that's right. But that's not what Paul says right here. He's in the middle of a chapter on spiritual gifts, and he says, For by one spirit you were all baptized into the one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, and you were all made to drink from the same spirit. So by virtue of our baptism into Christ, we are admitted to drink from the reservoir of the Holy Spirit. Then God decides which gifts to give us. See? Now, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, there's an uncomfortable thing said there. Look at what it says. To each one... How many of us is that to each one? Yeah, that's everybody. And if you go to Ephesians 4, that passage that we were at a moment ago, go back to Ephesians 4, verse 7. He says, to each one of us, is this grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ? So if I read Paul right, Paul says every Christian is given some spiritual gift. Who decides what gifts? God does. Now, There's another question we're going to talk about a little bit later because I want you to be a little bit uncomfortable, but were there certain spiritual gifts that were only given by the laying on of the apostles' hands? Yes, I think there were, and I'll show you why and which ones they were. But that doesn't in any way mean that all spiritual gifts were only transmitted by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Okay, so Paul says we all got baptized into the body of Christ and we were all allowed to drink from the same spirit. Verse 14, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not therefore the body. This doesn't make it not of the body, does it? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, then I am not of the body. It's not for this reason, not part of the body, is it? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? So what he's saying is, even though we all drink from the reservoir of the Spirit, the Spirit manifests himself in each one of us in different ways to achieve different functions 
Those are the spiritual gifts which God gives each one of us. Okay? So this goes back, see, to uh, verse 7. To each one of us, the manifestation of the Spirit is given according to the, for the common good. Or verse 11, all of these works one of the same Spirit, giving to each one individually as he wills. And this is like eyes, ears, noses, thumbs, like we see in that little song with the grandkids, head and shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, head and shoulders, knees and toes, knees, toes. So we're all different. See, I may be a little toe and you may be an ear, but we're still part of the same body. Who made me a toe and you an ear? Well, God did. The Holy Spirit did. See, we don't know what to do with this passage because we have relegated it to antiquity and said this doesn't apply to us. But if you read Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4, you'll be hard-pressed to keep that idea. It does apply to us. We have to have some, some parameters of application to us, some limitations on it. But certainly the principle here does apply. So then if you read down through here, um, verse 21, he says, the eye doesn't say to the hand, I don't need you. And again, the head doesn't say to the foot, I don't need you. Uh, and then he talks about all the different parts of the body and some honorable, some more honorable, and, and uh, that they all need each other. Look at verse 25, the principle that he's getting at here. So that there might be no division in the body. Has that been talked about anywhere else in Corinthians? Yes. Now look at that word. So there might not be any division in the body. What does he mean, the body? <laughs> Now go back to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 18. First of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there are divisions among you. Okay? And now he says there are divisions in the body, but there shouldn't be because we're all, even though we have different gifts, different functions... We're all supposed to be doing, uh, working t together for the common goal. You know, think of it as building a house. You've got your, your big heavy equipment people that dig the foundation. You've got your concrete people that pour it, pour the footings. You've got your framers, you know, and your floorers that, that put the frame on. You've got your roofers. You've got your electricians. You've got your plumbers. Plumbers don't do the same things that electricians do. But they're all trying to build a house, right? That's the idea here in these passages. God made some of us plumbers, some of us electricians, but we're all trying to build up the body of Christ. So he says in verse 25 that there be no division in the body, but they should all have the same care or concern. All the members should have the same concern for one another. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is glorified, all the members rejoice with it. One time when I was a kid in junior high school, eighth grade or ninth grade, I was trying to pick up an eight pound shot put. You know what a shot put is, that, that yeah. round iron ball, you know? I was trying to pick up an eight-pound shot put, and another kid had a 12-pound shot put, and he wanted the eight-pound shot put, so he threw the 12-pounder, and about the time I picked up the eight-pounder, the 12-pounder smacked right against my finger like two marbles coming together. Pop! Just like that. Broke my finger just right off the top, the bone at the top. And that... It was like a cartoon. That finger swelled up and it started going thump, 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 thump. I could feel my heart burning out. I was jumping around screaming, oh, 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 oh. My, en my entire body was focused on that finger. 
right there. And my entire body was saying, owie, owie, I've got a bad owie right there. So when one member of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. And when one member of the body rejoices, the whole body rejoices. Uh, one time I got me a foot massage. And this Chinese woman was working on my foot. And I said, oh, my goodness, that feels good. Oh, ah, ooh, ah. And my entire body was so happy over what my foot was experiencing. <laughs> so the body is all connected. And, and the body is not in competition with itself or else it's going to die. The body is in cooperation with itself, see? And the different members of the body function differently, but they're all working toward the good of the building up of the body. So this theme goes through chapter 11, and it goes through chapter 12, and it goes through chapter 13 and 14 about the oneness of the body and the unity in the body. Verse 27, you are the body of Christ and members individually of it. And God has placed in the church or the body, first of all, apostles. Does that mean apostle is a spiritual gift? Yes. Secondly, prophets. If you go back to verse 10, you'll see the gift of prophecy in verse 10. Thirdly, teachers. I don't think you have the gift of teaching in the first part in 8 through 10, but it's here and in Romans and in Ephesians. Uh, then miracles. If you go back to verse uh, 10, you have the working of miracles or the working of mighty deeds. The word is dunamis. Uh, then gifts of healing. You have gifts of healing in verse 9 and here. Then helps. What do you have besides helps after the gift of healing? Any other translation there? Administrations. Well, that one comes after helps. What do you have right before administrations? Helps, okay. So what exactly this gift is, I'm not sure. Uh, this general gift called helping or helps, I'm not sure what that means. Then you have government, governing, managing. Similar word over in Romans 12, not exactly the same word. Then you have different kinds of tongues or languages. Uh, Acts 2 verse 11, we hear them speaking in our tongues. The manifold wisdom of God. Our tongues. Parthian, Mede, Mesopotamian, Arabic. Those were actual tongues, actual languages. See? Um, then he says, rhetorically, are all apostles? And the answer to every one of these questions is no. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. So I don't have to be a prophet. And I don't have to be a, an apostle. Are all teachers? No, I don't have to be a teacher. Are all workers of miracles? No. Are all, do all have gifts of healings? No. Do all speak with tongues? Yet. Do all translate? Ook. Z be zealous of the greater gifts. So what was happening was these people were focusing on certain lesser gifts that were real showy, like speaking in tongues. And they were competitive for the spotlight of using those showy gifts. And instead of thinking about the good of the body and how they could move forward the church and accomplish the ministries of the church, they were thinking about self-aggrandizement and they were being selfish. And so division resulted instead of unity in the body. <clears throat> All right, so if you listed out your gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 
you would have, uh, let's see here, you would have uh, wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, the discerning of spirits, different languages, the translation of languages, the gift of being an apostle, the gift of being a teacher, the gift of helps, whatever that one was, the gift of governments or administration. I don't know how many that is, but that's the ones that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12. 13. I thought there were just nine. No, there's more. But then, see, if we go over to um, Romans 12, let's flip over there real quick again to Romans 12, verse 6. He says, having gifts differing according to the grace that was given to us, whether prophecy, we've already got that one. Then he says in verse 7, or ministry. See, that's one that wasn't listed in 1 Corinthians 12 unless you include verse 5. Then you have teaching. Uh, Then in verse 8 you have encouraging, encouragement, the gift of encouragement. Then you have in verse 8 also giving, the gift of giving. Then you have managing, and this is a little different word than the word in in, uh, 1 Corinthians 12. And then you have the one who shows mercy. Let him do it with cheerfulness. So mercy is a gift. Aren't we all supposed to be merciful? Yes. But we don't all have the gift of mercy. And we should not all spend the majority of our time showing mercy. All right, and go over to Ephesians 4.11. Ephesians 4.11. You have a few more. He gave some to be apostles. Yeah, we had that one in Corinthians. Prophets. Yeah, we had that one in both Romans and Corinthians. Evangelists. There's one for you. Pastors and teachers. Those seem to refer to elders slash teachers. So, do you mean evangelist is a spiritual gift? Wow. Pastor, shepherd, teacher, that's a spiritual gift. Well, see, if I look at it that way, it's different than if I just look at it like this is something that I've done on my own. So we've got quite a list there of spiritual gifts. And I'm not sure even that encapsulates encapsulates all of the gifts that are possible for us today. So with that in mind, Senior Mickey Mouse says it's another five minutes that we need to take. Cinco minutos. Oh. Thank you.